Good morning, Roma, and thank you for joining us for this Collective Voices session. And today with the focus being on carers and people who are supporting for family and friends through emotional distress and suicidal crisis. And yeah, I really just want to thank you for being part of this and adding to our available resources. And I just want to start off by just saying, or well, just checking in and seeing what you, what sort of morning you're having. Have you been outside or have you done anything adventurous this morning? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, I did for a second. I was outside. I usually like to spend a bit of time outside in my garden. Um, okay. But yeah. Nice. I connected with my cat. You and can. my husband. <laughs> and your husband. That's mm. brilliant. Like I said, like the focus is about uh, bringing that, the voice of insight into those people who have cared for people through emotional distress and suicidal crisis. Because often it's those voices that are sometimes missed and sometimes left wondering, hey, who's, who's going to support me with this? And we really just want to create some resources and some, some airway around that. So I just want to start off by just coming back to in the times that you've been supporting someone through emotional distress or suicidal crisis. And I'd just like to dive into how that was, how that played out with your work-life balance as well and what sort of role your workplace played on influencing your ability to, to care for, for someone. Oh, thank you for the question. I think it's a really important question. Um, and in short, it was complex. Um, and I'm thinking back to a time when I was in a different career than I'm in now. So now I'm in suicide prevention. Um, so and what, what, was, what was the career you were in at that point? Oh, I was in education, in the education mm -hmm. sector and um, in, a, in a leadership role. And it is something that I see playing out time and time again. So when I connect with people in the suicide prevention sector, it seems to me that there's a lot of women like myself who were in executive leadership roles, if you could say, who when they were supporting, often it's their child. Um, so that whole thing around mothering, um, it just got a bit too much and that the the leadership field wasn't able to really accommodate the needs of those of us who were in distress ourselves because our children were in suicidal distress. And I don't think the workplaces recognised um, that, that level of distress that we were in. You know, and I take full responsibility for the fact that I was wearing this superb mask, looking mm -hmm. like I was cool, calm and collected. So when I was communicating, like, this is really hard. Um, if I'm looking tired because I'm not sleeping, it's to do with stuff that's happening at home. Um, I recognise now with, you know, compassion that people are probably looking at me going, you look fine to me um, because I'm really good at that, you know. Um, mm. But by the same token, um, I remember, and even myself, I went through this myself. So my mother died by, you know, protracted cancer, you know, a disease, which was pretty awful. And I, I do remember around the same time observing someone who was being supported by the workplace significantly like the empathy was just palpable and they were away for some three weeks because their mother took them took a lot a lot long longer than usual to die um, mm -hmm. and just the support around this person because it was cancer which is a socially acceptable um, condition so to speak that's what it felt like this is my perspective now if we were to get to that point in workplaces where if you're saying that I'm supporting someone or I need support to be with someone who is likely at, at risk of dying because that's what suicide is mm. um, to, to have the community wrap themselves around me like they did that person who happened to be a male leader would have been wonderful and I think once we get there you know, when the stigma's gone and people understand the complexity and, and the impact on carers who are likely to be in distress themselves, um, because I think it's led to my own suicide ideation, it got so traumatic for me, then I think we've arrived. So that's what I look forward to. So I think we've got a, a way to go. And I look forward to a time where people like myself, like particularly women, who often take on the caring kind of load and um, emotional labour at home, um, make the choices to leave wonderful careers because the balance isn't right, you know? So, yeah. yeah for sure. That. And, and it's, it's nice that there's examples of uh, like supportive workplaces around that 
you're right. We, we do often hear the story that when it comes to supporting someone through like suicidal crisis, that a workplace might not be as supportive. And that stigma still does play a really, really massive role in that. And you mentioned sort of like, it'd be nice when we get to a place. What do you think the world will look like when we have supportive workplaces? And how could a workplace be more supportive for, for someone who is a carer? Um, I think it's evolving. You know, my guess is that if you're not a leader, um, it's getting better. I think my point, the point I want to address is, is, and we have lots of examples of that. If you think about it, we have examples at the highest level of government and leadership in this country where, you know, I'm thinking of multiple male leaders who might have a mental health condition, um, and I use that term quite loosely um, here, um, who may, we don't know if they're, they're in distress from from the perspective of suicide ideation uh, or attempts, but they they are forced to resign. And it seems to be that if you're in leadership, you can't do your job. Yet I'm sure if I had cancer and I was in leadership, I would be given the time to go, go away and get well, and then I can return to my job. So there's this kind of, you know, for me, my point is that in leadership, um, it doesn't mean you can't do the job. It means you need the time away to get well for a whole range of reasons um, and, and to come back when you're, you're ready. It doesn't make you disabled to do that position if you so choose. Bearing in mind, um, I think when you hit crisis points like that, you start to address do I really want to be doing this in the first place you know but I think if the work workplace supported leaders um, more effectively maybe that question wouldn't enter into your mind yeah yeah that's a really good point and I just want to come back to something you mentioned earlier on around wearing a mask and that we often all go through life wearing many different masks but I'm wondering before I get there would you be able to put a bit of context around what your lived experience of being a carer and a supporter has been like and just around how that how that's played out in your life so far? Oh, it's complex. It's so complex. We could, you know, um, sit here for hours. Um, and it's been an ongoing journey and the journey hasn't ended for me, let's just say that. So right now, here and now, this is what I've learned. So, and that's the good side of it. I like to learn. So there's been a hell of a lot of learning. It's been the hardest thing in my life. Um, the journey around masking, um, so I've just naturally, because of the work that I've done and the roles that I've had in my family, you know, I look cool, calm and collected. Um, it's just what my body does. You know, I've learned to accept that that's what my body does. But I've also had to learn the hard way that um, I'm at risk um, and accepting that. So, I mean, when I think of when I'm in critical kind of situations, so my son may be in crisis and we're having to seek support you know I'm presenting I'm sure to the other people like I said before cool calm collected she's in control actually inside I'm going ah, help me I'm disintegrating literally disintegrating and it wasn't until fairly recently that I realized when I was in that position that I recognized those body signals that come about when I think I'm in physical danger so there have been a couple of unfortunately I think when you've lived a life um, you do come across times when you may be at physical um, and emotional attack and that's happened to me unfortunately and so um, I recognize oh that's the same warning signals for whatever reason I was able to step outside detach a little bit and recognize that's the same signal I'm getting um, my body, my brain and the rest of my body, my stomach, everything is telling me I'm under attack and I needed to, I need to listen to that because what that means is um, my self-care has not been happening, you know, um, and if I continue this, I will, I will continue the trauma cycle for myself and, and also a codependency cycle in relationship to myself and, and my son. So those are the sorts of things that I've, it's taken, you know, a long time for me to recognise, but that I'm very vulnerable and that I'm just, you know, just as traumatised um, as anybody else witnessing, you know, this. And I don't think, um, I'm not sure the medical system, um, the health sector appreciates that the carers that front up supporting their loved one 
are standing there probably with this mask on because that's the role they need. You know, they need to be the calm, cool, collected person to make sure that the person they're supported is as calm as possible. But inside, they could be very much dying within. They're also in distress. So whenever you hit the bumps in the road with the health sector, so when you get turned away or when you get stigmatised, when you get criticised, um, when people are operating or relating with you because of stereotypes around carers and othering that can occur, um, that just intensifies really for me it feels like trauma and there's I have a complex history because I'm also bereaved by suicide and I think that just plays into my sense of feeling very much in distress because for me um, if I hear that my son has attempted then for me it's very real it's I there's no denial factor that denial I, I lost that suicide can happen denial um, aspect of life a long time ago when my brother took his life. So for me, it's very real. This stuff happens. And sometimes I encounter people who kind of out of self-protection go, oh, no, it's okay. He'll be fine. Thinking, how do you know that? You know, yeah, exactly. my life changed, you know, in one second one day, you know. Um, yeah. So that's that's what happens. Um, yeah. Okay. So you, you sort of spoke about being able to take off the mask, like when you – you become aware of certain signs and things on in your, that are happening in your body. And you sort of mentioned parts about trauma as well. I'm just wondering, well, throughout the day-to-day life of caring for your son and the various settings that you go through, like you mentioned the healthcare setting and all those sort of facets, what's it do to you like having to take the mask on and off and actually having that, that, that awareness that, hang on, I need to put on this mask because I'm going to this setting. Like, how do you, how do you handle that? How do I handle it? Um, I'm used to having to put a mask on because, you know, when you're an educator, so I was in in schools and I worked with, you know, pretty disadvantaged groups, um, disenfranchised groups. That was something that attracted me. Uh, Needing to be cool, calm and collected was, you know, part of managing that situation and and helping them to thrive, you know. So taking the mask on and off, for me, my problem was um, taking the mask off, you know, as in thinking I was always calm, cool and collected. There was anxiety, but acknowledging that I I was vulnerable because, you know, I, I constructed this identity of me being the one in control, the one looking after everyone, you know, I was, and also society constructed that for me. My cultural upbringing constructed that for me. I took that on, you know, take full responsibility for that, but I took it on beautifully. I was the perfect mother caring for everybody until I got to a point where I thought, oh, I'm not, yeah, I'm in trouble here. Um, You know, I kind of, um, I burnt out and that's, that's me pushing beyond the line that I needed to and and I didn't take time for self-care and so it was a big learning curve for myself and my and my family but particular for me and it's still something I I have to learn is I have to stop and detach and look after me it's sort of like the you know when you're on the airplane and you've got a baby you put the oxygen mask on yourself before the baby it's counterintuitive you know for mothering I would suggest that you'd want to save your baby uh first but it's the same deal when you when you are supporting someone in distress you've got to take care of you so that you can make really good decisions and support them because your brain won't be able to do that that's what we know your body won't be able to do that unless you are centered and and fully um in a position to be calm and collected properly calm and collected so you can get your executive functioning happening um, to make really good decisions and support people. Definitely. And and you, you're really highlighting a really valid point that effectively the most important relationship that we have is the one we have with ourselves because from there stems our ability to be be a carer or be a parent or be a colleague for other people. And you, you've touched on self-care. Where does self-care come in in your life now in terms of like your role within being a carer? Like how do you prioritise it? What do you do? And how do you how do you manage that and keep boundaries around it to protect the vital role that self care is for your for your for your life? It's actually really hard 
for me. It might be easier for others, but I come from a cultural, you know, an ethnic background. Um, so I have an Italian heritage, Southern Calabrian, um, which is very rich and I absolutely love and adore, but there are aspects of it. So I was hard that are quite problematic in the sense of our understanding of self-care because I am hardwired to care for others because it's a community-based kind of model. So I think of others first. It's something that I was born into. It's a community-based um, culture, whereas, you know, the Anglo society is more individualistic, if you know what I mean. So self-care, caring for yourself, particularly because I was a woman and well as I am, <laughs> but I was a woman constructed in that environment. I am hardwired to always think of other people first and serving other people. Um, I may come across as assertive and strong, but that's me code switching into different cultures, you know, because I live in Australia and I work in certain environments. But ultimately, self-care is countercultural for me and counterintuitive. So it's been a hard lesson for me to stop and say, no, I, I'm not going to be of any use to anyone here unless I care for myself. So I've recognised over time that, you know, I crossed that boundary where I, I needed to help myself. Otherwise, I was going to get very, very ill, um, you know, and, and that's been a, um, an interesting journey for me. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the second part of that question. I was just asking just around, like, how does self-care come into your life and what do you actually do for it now? Like, where does it come from? And how, how, do, you, how do you implement that in your life? Okay. For me, the self-care is, at the moment, really around um, really being in touch with my relationship um, and when the boundaries seem to be getting a bit frayed. So having to set really strong boundaries with my son. So, you know, obviously as he was growing up as a child, you know, he would seek me out. I was, you know, his support person. Um, and then it was really interesting as he transitioned into adulthood. Um, I started to realise that, oh, this, for me, you know, once he got into adulthood, that transition into adulthood was a bit tricky um, and I didn't want to perpetuate any codependency between us. So being aware of some of those body signals that I referred to before, um, you know, being a little bit detached and saying, no, um, uh, you're going to have to make this decision. I'm not making this decision for you. I'm here to support you in your decision. I'm here to give you information regarding what to do next, but that's your choice. Um or it could be, um, you know what, I'm just not in the right space for supporting you and hearing about where you're at at the moment. Um, and I've had that conversation with him once I realised the complication around my grief over a lifetime and my trauma over a lifetime. So I was able to have that very open conversation and say to him, you know what, and, and for me to have the... <laughs> the pride to say, I don't think I'm the best person for you today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you know, just, just to have the vulnerability. So I was a little bit proud or I felt like a failed parent always having to be there for him, you know? So I had to get to a point where I could let that go and say to him, I don't think I'm going to be the best support for you today. This is um, really evoking a lot of emotion in me. Uh, I can feel it in my body. Um, it could be around the anniversary of something, whatever it is. Today is not the day. And if you need the support, maybe you need to find it somewhere else, you know, via other people, other processes, other systems. So getting those resources around him was really important. So giving him the information, equipping him to take control of his own health and well-being. But even, even for you, that is such a pivotal life moment as you just described it then, being in that place to actually go, hold on, today is not a good day for me. But to, to actually get to that place for yourself, I imagine that's, like you mentioned, it was a pretty hard thing to do and sort of take that pride and go, hang on, like all this stuff came up about being a bad mother, but it sounds like the most selfless act that you could do is to actually go, hang on, I know that you need support right now, but I can't do that. I'm just wondering, is, is this the, like you mentioned earlier on, thank you for sharing about 
having your own thoughts of suicide through the process of caring for your son was this after you sort of came to that awareness and went hang on i need to do this myself or what what really led you to that point to have that conversation um you know and full credit to my son he took it on board you know Mm -hmm. um you know there's lots of things about my son that you know he could have chosen to really get aggro about it but he didn't he took it on board and he's taken it seriously not that it wasn't difficult because you know um it's not easy I'm not saying it was oh this wonderful Disney kind of experience because it wasn't it was really heartening um you know heartbreaking as well as heartening at the same time but um I think it was that realisation I'm in danger here. And also I think it was a health issue. I mean, I confronted um, a minor, well, it's not minor, I ended up with a health, uh, for a very short period of time, a health condition, which I knew that if I didn't do something about, um, it's the first, you know, rung on the ladder to possibly serious health conditions so maybe that was the wake-up call but it was that moment when I when I realized my body is telling me I'm in danger now I'm not in danger my you know my son's not going to attack me so what's going on for me here Mm. um that it that's what it was and it was a moment of insight where I was able to detach and then um it's that that detachment you know like um cutting the umbilical cord, I suppose, to use that metaphor, um, stepping back and seeing it differently. That was the disposition, luckily, that I was in to be able to do that and to communicate with him clearly about it that um, meant a lot to me. I'm not saying it's easy because it's not because I still struggle with it. I still, you know, I hear... um, myself thinking in ways and then I have to stop and go oh I'm there again so I see I'm not afraid of those thoughts whereas my son looks like he's really um terrorized by them all right so his his journey is different to mine but it took some so part of that process of detaching and seeing the world differently meant that I recognized finally that when I started having those thoughts which have started a long time ago actually they weren't part of the complex grief I was dealing with. Well, they could be, you know, it depends on interpretation. Um, I just put it down to, oh, well, that's normal, you know, um, I'm bereaved by suicide, it's just going to, that's normal, okay, it's there. It's interesting, I've never been really terrorised by it, so I've never attempted, I've never gone that far, maybe that's why. But it's not until recently I've seen the pattern and realised, oh, and I've helped my son with this and hopefully he's seeing it from a different perspective too. So I've been very clear about, you know what, when those thoughts come up for me, I recognise it as my body trying to protect me, trying to warn me. So those thoughts are there, sort of like mindfulness. Oh, there they are. They're there. And to welcome them as in, oh, you're there again. Okay, that means telling myself, you know, getting those pathways <laughs> happening in my brain. Mm-hmm oh, it's protecting me. It's telling me the boundaries are blurred again. I'm tired again. Um, I haven't been doing the self-care I need to do. Like for me, that's, you know, a thing I'm, I have to be careful about. Mm. Yeah. It's a, it's a great way to interpret it too and just to acknowledge that, hey, they're here and it's feedback on what's going around my life and what else can this mean? Hang on, I need to have some sleep or I need some support. You, you've spoken about boundaries and I love the concept of boundaries and boundaries are something that I'll probably work on for the rest of my life in and out of different relationships in life. But I just want to talk about the role of boundaries when it comes to supporting your son from a carer's perspective when he needs to get support and what that looks like in different circles and, and how you've managed to operate with, with boundaries in place when you, you're sort of going in and out of different systems and education systems and all that. Just wondering if you could speak into that well, a little bit. Yeah, it's hard. Um, boundaries. Um, boundaries with my son are around avoiding codependency. And I'd have to say that schooling systems, you know, I work within it and I value the schooling system incredibly. Um, and I was part of it, you know, um, and also health systems do tend, I can generalise here, to 
they don't know that they're doing it, but they can enable codependency either between carers and, and the, the people they're supporting um, and or codependency within the systems themselves, if you know what I mean by that. So you keep going back, you keep being the, you know, the client, you know, so to speak, and, you know, the consumer, which I don't like that as a term, um, you consume it's probably a really good term because that's how it's you know set up to to be but it, i'm not your usual carer i'm not your ste- well, i should say i'm not your stereotypical support person so you know the boundaries for me have been around when we've um approach service providers of any sort whether it's in the schooling sector or or in the health sector to support my son who also has some disabilities um there was this kind of stereotype operating um and even in the mental health sector there's some anti-carer movements emerging which i don't think are helpful i don't think any binary kind of you know anti is helpful in any of the suicide prevention or mental health sector, I think we need to accept diversity and lean in and listen. But anyway, so for me, there's always been this um, interesting relationship with uh, people in positions of power and the assumptions that they make about either my son or myself or my family. We've had some pretty horrific interactions to you know when running up to children's ed as well as um adult ed um we're not doing that again let's just say that you know we well, what's it what's it like uh for being in the school system like the education system and caring and i guess have, having conversations with the school and the educators around that was that something you you navigated I had to navigate it because I was actually in the schooling sector myself and my mm. children were going to schools within the same sector that I was employed in. So it was really difficult. It was really complex. So managing relationships is key um, and really it's leadership. So carers very much or supporters are very much leaders in their own right um, because you have to manage those relationships carefully um, so that your support for your, you know, care and the person that you're caring for um, helps them to thrive. So I'm not interested in survival. I'm interested in helping my son thrive as a fully independent adult in the world. So to do that um, sometimes meant, you know, rubbing up against some pretty um, tough scenarios and headbutting and managing that with all the skill set that I had. And I can't say that I did it always effectively, but trying to make sure that he was able to thrive in the long run meant that I was dragging him kicking and screaming to school sometimes. And that was really hard as a mum because, you know, here I am literally dragging him to school because I knew it was better for him in the long run. I'm dragging him to a place where I know he's feeling unsafe. That was the most difficult thing. And so I was like dragging him to school and, sitting in my car, bawling my eyes out and just hoping this might play out, you know. Um, I'm not sure. (laughs) I think we're both still traumatised by all of that. Um, In the end, he finished year 12. He ended up with a school award, a significant school award, which is credit to the school itself. But it was a bumpy road. Um, uh, We learnt from each other, you know, the leaders and and the teachers and I'm indebted to the teachers who really cared for him because he found some really positive role models as well. Um, and as far as the the medical sector is concerned, just again navigating stereotypes. I felt judged a lot of the time, but that could have been just me as well, just feeling judged all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, I think they saw me as someone curious because I wasn't stereotypical and I would I had the the privileged um, position of being educated and thinking in a particular way and presenting myself in a particular way. So I could actually challenge people in in a way when it got really hard. And I often worried about people who weren't as privileged as myself, who, who were, you know, disempowered by the system. So, you know, we, 
when we confronted disadvantaged or othering, you know, when it was worth our effort, you know, we were able to to lean back in and, you know, uh, and make some comments and and or choose to go elsewhere, you know. So it's been a bit hard. So when you're talking about boundaries, it's it's hard and it still is hard. It still is hard. A lot of the, how you speak about like your ability as a carer is really, it's really focused on an empowerment way, like trying to give that power back to your son and give him a level of control and that input in there. I'm just wondering when, when it comes to, like you mentioned about being able to handle and have conversations with people in somewhat authority figures because you could do it that way what would be your advice for other people in terms of to have those conversations like how could they prepare for them and how could they facilitate those in a way that I guess keep keep some of the power in the corner of the person they're supporting Mm. so power is really significant it's always for me it's always about power and some of the systems we put in place um in our schooling sector so you know I work for an organization that was fortunately aware of that so I worked um, with regard to the disability kind of side of my son's Mm -hmm. life learned a lot from that because they were quite careful ensuring that you know who was around the table was representative so advice to people would be when there's too many clinicians in the room don't buy into it you need all the support you can get so if there's three of them then you make sure there's three of you or if not four to just level the playing field. And if they don't like that, then you say, well, there's only going to be one of you. So, you know, I mean, you you can demand some of this stuff if you have the energy to. But, you know, don't walk into a scenario where you feel disempowered. Um, just physically disempowered is the first step. The, the minute you say, no, I'm not buying into this, then you can, you're already signaling to them, no, I'm aware of the power relationships here. Um, one of the hardest lessons, believe it or not, I've had to learn is to trust my, trust my intuition. So if I'm, you know, which is that body signals recognising, so I'm thinking, oh, I don't like this, is to go with it. Because in the long run, if I didn't listen to my intuition earlier, I'd learn the hard way. So I would just, you know, that I would advise people to listen to what your body's saying. If you're not feeling okay, you need a break. You need to, can we just stop for a minute and then, you know, grab the person you're supporting and your advocate, hopefully you've got one there, you know, and touch base and then go back into the meeting if that's what's happening. If, you, if you're feeling unsafe, you stop it, you tell them and you tell them why. So that's the advice I would be giving is to empower yourself um, either by making sure there are other people to be aware of power relationships Mm -hmm. and to redress the power relationships wherever possible you have you you must be your own advocate you must be your your, um, the person you're supporting's advocate as well as your own keep yourself safe you have to keep them safe and keep yourself safe that sounds like a really really good strategy to to implement and it sounds quite effective to, to really just have semi-level playing fields. We, we often talk about supporting a child or supporting an adult, and it sounds like you've transitioned along the way. I'm just wondering what's that experience been like for you to be supporting someone as they cross over a threshold to be classed as an adult or cross into a threshold where all of a sudden they have more rights and responsibility than what they did. It could even be the day before. What's that been like for you? Oh, that was, yeah, that was hairy. Um, you know, literally the minute he turned 18, suddenly things changed. Nobody warned us. <laughs> Maybe I was supposed to know. So um, the carer relationship or the supporter relationship completely changed from that day. Um, and I was really evident. It was really evident because that, that day, we, you know, if you had to go to the doctor for an appointment, um, suddenly oh, sorry, you haven't filled in the forms. Now, those forms were supposed to have been filled four years previously. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, so even the, the doctor's surgery didn't even think about it, you know? So um, it just completely changed. So it suddenly it was he needed to fill in forms to um, provide, um, you know, permission. Um, and the landscape changed. Now, my my son um, 
has been diagnosed with the label of, you know, autistic or he's in a neurodiverse community, which, by the way, spiralled him to a tent. So I'm not sure that the labelling is a good thing. Um, so if, and he's a bit yes or no, he may or may not be on the spectrum, um, but there was no transition. So if he, and it, but he does need transition. So there, there are days where people think, yeah, you are. So the transition would have been nice. The preparation would have been nice. Um, and so where he probably, and we got him into this pattern of codependency, I suppose you can call it, or parent-child, you know, power relationships are quite, you know, different then, you know. Then suddenly, and it kind of merged, was blurring into a little bit of codependency. So he found it very difficult when I kind of dawned on me, okay, he's an adult now. I think 18 is a bit young personally, but he's got to make, these are his choices. So, you know, cutting that umbilical cord, I had to do it gradually. Um, uh, detaching, I had to do that gradually. I absolutely believe it's his right to take responsibility for his life because I want him to thrive as an adult. Having said that, it was difficult for him. So he's resisted some of it and he's, not necessarily welcomed as anybody wouldn't, you know, oh, my goodness, now I have to take responsibility. Um, you know, so accountability for his choices and putting them right back on him um, needed to be done um, and it was a process which he resisted, um, but it wasn't always easy for me because I have to trust his decisions. And it's been a bit of a learning journey. He's 21, so it's been three years. Um, and I've learnt that um, actually he knows himself best and he actually makes some really good decisions, even though I may not or I worry about some of those decisions, for example, around medication. So at one point he decided he needed medication and I wasn't sure if that was a good thing. So he went on it and then he then it wasn't really helpful in the long run. Um, and then we worked out he's taken himself off of it. Then we were worried about that. But I think looking back, I said to him, because he was thinking, oh, he made the wrong decision. And I said, no, maybe you did need it. And when your body started to react in a different way, you just made the assumption, as did the medical practitioners, you needed more. It was probably your body saying, I've had enough now. I can come off of it because he's in a better place now that he's off. He's, you know, graduated mm -hmm. himself off the medication. So he's learned to, you know, he's made some really good decisions around his own health care. But I'm, I'm saying it's not been easy, but it's because of, we're really determined for him to be autonomous. He has human rights around his decisions of that for his own life. And sometimes we can forget that as uh, because we get so comfortable and used to being the supporter, making decisions for them, particularly if you're the parent, you know. And I got a little bit comfortable doing that. So it was a bit hairy to sit back and watch him make his mistakes, so to speak, which is just the role of being a parent anyway and letting go. Definitely. Definitely. Just wondering, like I've heard you speak about the role of, learned helplessness before and how that plays out I guess over, over over sort of a lifetime of being in and out of the system and learning how to do things are you able to speak into how did that in uh how did that interact and influence that transition for you and the ability for your son to do that and get and get to that place where like you said like you really want to set him up to thrive rather than just to survive and it sounds almost like you've described the, the system with that codependency part, it's more like they just want people just to survive and you're really trying to get into enhance that life and push into that thrive part. What role did that play in it? Oh, it's huge. Um, and it's been, you know, it's because I was an educator. So, our, you know, the way I interpreted being an educator was that it was our role to help young people thrive. You know what I mean? So I've just transferred that kind of thinking across in my parenting. We know that's what we need to do. But, you know, it seems to me that even in the schooling sector and also in the, the allied health and, and medical sector, there are people who have wonderful intentions. They want to support people. But the codependent relationship can emerge if you're not careful. And like I said earlier, the, there are systems in place. People don't realise because it's probably not conscious or reflective that you're actually enabling learned helplessness um, and 
you know, my son's great at, um, he learnt very early and it could be part of his personality to make things very difficult so he could get his way, you know. He's learnt all sorts of strategies and some of them he may have learnt from home. A lot he learnt either at school or in the the allied health or health sector by well-meaning practitioners who were uncomfortable when he resisted and let him have his way, if you know what I mean by Mm -hmm. that. You know, instead of the hard, quicker road of going, setting those boundaries really clearly. So that's what I mean. So I found that a lot of um, uh, my work recently has been undoing some of that learnt helplessness um, and we talked about victimhood. He doesn't like it when I say that. I, you know, I might reflect back. This sounds like, you know, victimhood, et cetera, et cetera. No one likes that, you know, um, in, when you're relating. You know, are we playing that now? What's going on here? Um, and he's only 21. When I think back to myself at 21, I mean, I'm expecting higher standards of him probably than I had of myself, to be honest. But he needs those high standards so that he can ne- you know, um, navigate the the medical and the allied health sector. You know what I mean? So I have to protect him in that way. So, yeah, the learned helplessness comes from well-meaning services, service providers. And every now and again, you know, we talked about my role as the support person. I have to come in and I had to do it pretty recently, actually, and just gently become curious with a service provider about whether what they were doing was getting anywhere, whether we were meeting the goals and the objectives and whether whether or not we were actually enabling. And, the, you know, I, I this was a, a good example of where they were actually, at. Well, you mean enabling, so the words didn't come out of my mouth. So you can carefully um, have the conversation in a respectful relationship. So if you establish a respectful relationship you can have like carefully have that conversation where they have the aha moment that's always the best outcome not you telling them you're enabling but they were oh okay and things have shifted so I think you know that's what you have to do um and that's where it's been difficult it you know the learned helplessness that he's picked up has come through for him um, most of his life of working with people who who meant very well but in the long run um didn't really help yeah it sounds like a great strategy and it sounds also testament to the the great relationship that you have and that that trust that must exist for you to have those conversations and yeah it's really great to hear that I just want to come Thank to you. another part of caring and we've been talking about the the empowerment sort of part and really giving him that self-agency part. I've spoken to many people who care and there's been points in life where supporting to someone, you sort of had to make decisions for them when they haven't been have that capacity. Just want to wonder, can you speak about that? And if you've had concerns like along the way of how you manage, I guess manage, manage like your own internal fear of someone resenting you for making a decision that is for them and how that's played out in your life? Well, you know, I refer to the the example of, you know, dragging him kicking and screaming to an unsafe schooling environment in his eyes, right, mm-hmm. um, knowing full well that this was best for him. And in some ways, you know, I also had to, we had to drag him kicking and screaming to psychologists um, when he was younger. So for me, it was difficult. It's a parenting thing. For me, it's no different to being a parent, you know, like sometimes it's just the way it goes for me, you know. Sometimes your kids well, you know, it's a bumpy road. Some kids will resist what's best for them in the long run and you hope it's best for them. So it's really difficult. It's that knot in your stomach. It's the the guilt that comes with that and um, and hoping, hoping that it all will end okay. Um, for me, uh, with regard to his health and well-being, as an adult, it's been he has to take full accountability for the choices that he needs to make. So I 
have worked really hard to let go of my own pride and sense of control to help him make decisions around um, what care he needs when he's in distress. And so um, recently I'll give an example of where he thought being sectioned under the Act might be worthwhile. So he's in that much distress that he was asking for, for me just to do that. And I said, you're an adult, that's your choice. I'm not doing it and this is why I'm not doing it. Um, and I told him what I've heard from people who have been under the Mental Health Act. This is what it feels like, looks like. And for some it works. Um, and I was suggesting to him, I don't think you're going to manage and it's going to be really hard to get you out if you're not managing, all right? I, I said, I'm not sure it's the best so I gave him the information. I'm not sure it's the best choice for you, but if you make that choice, that's on you. It's not on me. I will go with you, but it's not my de decision. It's your decision. So um, it's part of that whole process of, uh, you know, helping him to be fully accountable for the choices he makes. Um, it's not easy, not easy at all. Um, because in choosing to do that, I had to then work out, well, what are we going to do? You know, if he's this distressed, if he's, and he was, he was absolutely beside himself, how are we going to manage this? Um, and so we, I was able to um, transition him to um, a hybrid space that we have here in Adelaide, which I was part of the co-design process for, and that's been very successful for him. And he can take himself there. So the beauty of doing that. Um, so it's a there are clinicians there as well as lived experience people there, who peer support workers with lived experience of suicide. Um, so he's found that you know currently he he finds that very useful. And he can just pop on the bus and get himself there. And yeah, I went with him the first time, and since then that's his go-to place, which is yeah been really important. It sounds like a really like monumental step in in taking control like of his own life and and what an amazing way to do it just to have that conversation and lay out the facts and make it your choice. I just want to come to a couple of final questions. So throughout your life as a mother, as a carer, and a variety of other roles that you've been in and out of, what's been your proudest moment? Oh. Proudest moment. I haven't thought of that. That wasn't in the less in the questions. <laughs> My proudest moment. Um, I think uh, with regard to me in this role as a carer, you know, when he, he won that school award, that was remarkable, and it was the Perseverance Award, right? And it was the second, second or third, most important award. It's prestigious, you know, school. Um, because I learned through the research, that's where you're going to get success. The more money you pay, the more success you get in life, you know. So that's where they ended up, even though it was very difficult um, to afford. Um, but, and it was quite funny because these award days, he hated them because I had to sit there, as he would say, for 12 years watching the elite get rewarded yet again. And that's true. That's the way they're set up, right? And then so we were trying, he was in year 12, and we were trying to work out how he said, I cannot manage going again. I'm not doing it. You know, he's an adult, right? <laughs> and so we were trying to work out a way that he wasn't going to go to the to the award day, which is really important. So I rang up his support person at the school, which is lovely, and I rang her up and I said, oh, he's not going to go, you know, what can we do? Because there will be, you know, penalties for him not running up. She goes, well, we've got a happy problem. He's been awarded something. So then, you know, I had promised him that he would not go. <laughs> he would find a way. And because there's some secrecy in all of this. And so I just said, well, I'm just going to have to let him know he's got some award, but we're not going to go. You know, um, we're not going to tell him all of it. Some of it will be a surprise because there's different levels of awards and it was quite a significant award. And the the stuff that they read out was beautiful. And so it's an award given to students who have to overcome 
uh, either health or uh, health and well-being. Usually it's, it had been traditionally given to students who had major physical health conditions, you know, and they overcame them to still finish their schooling successfully. And so as far as I knew, this is the first time and they didn't, they weren't specific. They just left it as a health situation, condition, that, that it was a health and well-being one, which was really nice. And what was really amazing, he, he ended up crying on stage because the, the students you know, I think up until that moment, he still was still was feeling stigmatized and othered, you know, because of his disabilities and because of some of the, you know, stuff that he'd gone through. And in that moment, when they were all just cheering him on, it was just, I, I was not proud of me, I was proud of the schooling sector, the school, my son, the kids, the families, because in that moment, it, we it just was an aha moment. We got it right. Just in that moment, they recognised how bloody difficult this has been for him and for everybody. And he got there. He got through. He completed his year 12. He completed his SACE. And more than that, he ended up with a major school award. And what was really nice um, at one of the uh, celebratory dinners at the school did you know the rector of the school came up and acknowledged for the first time they may have been thinking this but acknowledgement is so important he said you know it comes from a really good family to be able to to get to this point and win this award but also to finish his studies and it was an acknowledgement that I had been in the background and we'd been in the background also shaking the system's to its knees to say no we're not going away and he's finishing I actually had this conversation he's finishing and it's on you to make sure he's finishing it what are you going to do about it because we're going to pull in our bit you know we're going to make him go you and we're going to support him but you've got to do it as well so that's what comes to mind it was a lovely story of um, recognition and success in the broadest way where everybody was successful where the relationships worked together nicely and the plaque that he got sits on his bedroom wall and he tells me every now and again when it gets really hard because it's all about perseverance beautiful mm -hmm. beautiful words he looks at it and he and it reminds him no I can do this I can move beyond this so yeah there's some well, proud I mean, pride in that but proud pride for everybody involved in that yeah yeah what an amazing story thank you for sharing and yeah, what a significant way to, to roll out, like finishing school and also to get that acknowledgement of, hey, he's got a great family around him. Just on the theme of surviving to going from surviving to thriving, what does thriving look like for you as you continue on to care for your son? Like, What does that look like for you? Yeah, well, that's really important. I mean, I'm often so focused on his own capacity to thrive that I forget about ours you know um you know like my marriage is intact and apparently that's really rare because you know we've got you know very layer you know varied layers of you know we both have lived experiences of suicide quite separately so before we knew each other um so even my my husband had witnessed a stranger attempt um and then I had my brother and, and then just you know partnering being parents of a child, you know, um, from the age of around seven or eight, saying he wants to die, um, it was really hard. And that was a response to him feeling very othered in the schooling environment, watching this really happy kid. Like when I think of him as a, a young kid, he was just happy and just that just... I'm waiting for him to be that happy again. He's just one of these happy, you know, you can give birth to really happy kids. He was one of them. You know, it's like I'm alive and I love life and that it just got flipped. Um, I'd like to be, that was me, I think, as a kid too, and I'd, I'd like to get there. I'd like to get there. Um, I'm going to be brutally honest. I mean, I live because of the fact that I'm bereaved by suicide and I know it can happen. Um it happens, you know, and I know what that looks like and feels like um, as a losing a sibling and just the thought of being a parent, you know. Um, I'm not sure I'll ever get there because the fear will always be there, you know what I mean? Um, because I've come to terms with the fact that 
my son's condition is probably a lifelong condition, you know, um, and that's just the way it's going to roll. It's not going to go away. There was a point in time where I thought, just get this to go away. You know, we could just find the cure. I don't think there's a cure. And I think it's all about management. Um, yeah, so what is thriving? Thriving looks like, you know, um, just being in good relationship. And, you know, the stuff that I've spoken today and you've, you've, you said, oh, that's great. You must have a great relationship. When I talked about those experiences, if, any, if anybody was videoing it, it would have looked very much like a freaking argument. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, oh, let's just talk. It's not easy. It's, no. it's, it feels like this. So I want to put that very clear. There's resistance and there's, it's messy and it's uncomfortable and it's, that's life. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not Disney plus movies, you know, it's not that at all. It's tough. It's really tough, um, but worthwhile. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for the conversation and I truly appreciated every second of it. And I'm sure that many people are going to get a lot out of this and, and hearing your vulnerabilities to speak about it. And I just love the, like, the final concept around like that perseverance, that award, it really sums up the story of your journey as a carer to consistently persevere and sometimes put yourself second, but still have that priority to know when when it's time to to put yourself first and step up and say, okay, this is where I'm at. So thank you so much for your time today, Roma. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate you listening to my story and and valuing it. So thank you. <laughs>